sometimes even some ethical dilemmas. I don't always agree with you, Michael. <laughs> Michael Portillo, Sundays on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Hello there, it's Eamon Holmes here from Breakfast on GB News. We're not just on your television and your screens, you know. We're on DAB plus digital radio, so you can listen to your favourite shows on the move. If you've not yet listened to GB News Radio, it's very simple. We're on your radio player and tune in apps. On your smart speaker, phone or tablet, or online at gbnews.uk. Take us with you wherever you go. GB News Radio. You never have to miss a moment of the People's Channel. Monday to Thursday nights on GB News. At 6, it's Deems & Co. 7 o'clock, Farage. At 8, join Mark Stein. And at 9, Dan Wooten tonight, followed by headliners. On TV, radio and online, this is GB News. Join me, Lawrence Fox, on GB News. Frank. Fun, fearless, and sometimes serious, much as I love a Friday night punch up, what I really want is a battle of ideas. I want to look at things differently. I want to hear different voices and engage with your unique experiences. Every Friday at 7 pm on GB News. Hello, I'm Esther Rackvey. And I'm Philip Davis. Whether you're watching or listening on TV, online or on radio, we handpick the latest stories, debates and expert opinions for your weekend. So whether that's politics, news or showbiz, we've got it covered. Join us every Saturday morning at 10 o'clock on GB News. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery and you can join me every weekday, 6 till 7 on Jubes and Kerr. Me and my panel will get stuck right into the day's events and I can tell you, in fact, I can warn you, expect some robust debates and strong opinions and perspectives from both sides of the fence. It's about you at home as well. I love to read out all of your comments or at least as many as I can. So join me, Michelle Jubery, Monday to Friday, 6 till 7 on Jubes and Kerr. I'm Mark Dolan. Join me at 11 on GB News for Headliners, in which I'll be joined by two of the UK's top comedians discussing tomorrow's papers. If it's an important story, we'll cover it, but we'll have some fun along the way. Headliners, the late night paper review that won't send you to sleep like the others will. Seven nights a week at 11 p.m. on GB News. Monday to Thursday on GB News, it's Bev Turner today from 10 a.m. We're going to be here for you, our GB News family, to keep you up to date, but also make you smile. The guy went from puberty to adultery. <laughs> and I can't wait to bring a few of my own opinions. I have no time for cultural totalitarianism. <laughs> we'll engage in passionate, but always polite debate with your thoughts and opinions at the center of it all. Only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Mark White. As GB News Home and Security Editor, I cover those key issues that are so important to you. Our authorities, our communities doing all they can to combat violent crime. With the public services under unbearable strain, why are we still failing to control our borders? Defence, the first priority of any government, has been continually hollowed out. Can we trust our politicians to protect the armed forces? Join me, Mark White, on GB News. Hello, good morning and welcome to Saturday Morning with Esther and Phil here on GB News. We've got lots coming up for you today and we've been asking you for your questions for Immigration Minister Robert Jenrick who joins us shortly. Also, we'll be discussing whether or not we need a referendum on not net zero and listening to the results of an exclusive poll about what people think about the banning of petrol and diesel cars. We'll be joined by Director of Car 26, Lois Perry, to talk about that. And also now, as uh, the illnesses are I don't know, we're finding out about them, about lockdown. We'll be joined by Professor Carl Hennigan to say, did we know all the implications of lockdown before we went into it? And we want to hear from you today, of course, so get involved in the conversation by emailing us on gbviews at gbnews.uk or tweet us at gbnews. But before we kick off, here are all your latest headlines with Bethany.
Thanks, Esther and Phil. Hello, good morning. It's two minutes past ten. I'm Bethany Elsie bringing you up to date from the GB newsroom. Parents are being urged to be vigilant and look out for symptoms of strep A after six children under the age of ten have died from the infection in the UK. Symptoms are usually mild, but the UK Health Security Agency is now investigating the rise in severe cases. Experts say that a lack of mixing during the COVID-19 pandemic could be behind a drop in immunity. Bacteriologist at the University of Aberdeen, Hugh Pennington, says spotting it early is key. Because the disease, this severe manifestation of the disease is so relatively rare, many doctors won't have seen a case and they may not have that um, high index of suspicion. The good news is that uh, treatment is straightforward with uh, penicillin. Uh, this is not a bug that's developed antibiotic resistance like so many other bacteria. It's still sensitive to penicillin. The, the whole issue really is can you get the penicillin in there quickly enough? Well, NHS GP Dr Veena Babu told GB News the symptoms parents should look out for. Strep A presents the most commonly in three ways. You can get a sore throat, you can get scarlet fever, or you could get a condition called impetigo. So scarlet fever presents as muscle aches, fever. You may get a rash on the skin, which feels what we call your typical sandpaper rash. So they, you might get some bumps coming up on the skin, and that could be on the arms, on the chest, or on the tummy. I would advise parents what we were saying, look, feel, and how the, your kids are feeding. In other news, there's more rail strikes to come this month as thousands of TSSA members are to walk out on the 17th of December in a long-running dispute over jobs, pay and conditions. Services from six further train operators are expected to be affected, on top of the two previously announced. The union's organising director, Luke Chester, says his members are fed up of being treated with contempt by employers and government. While the Department for Transport has urged unions and rail operators to work together to find a resolution. And in the NHS, neonatal and critical care units are among the services that will be protected from strikes in the build-up to Christmas. The Royal College of Nursing says chemotherapy, dialysis and paediatric intensive care will also not be impacted during planned industrial action on the 15th and 20th of December. Other services will be severely reduced. The G7 and Australia have agreed to restrict the amount Russia can be paid for crude oil. The countries, which include Britain and the US, say the price cap of $60 a barrel will prevent Moscow from profiting from the energy crisis. While on Friday, Russia, Russian crude oil was trading at around $67 a barrel. But a senior aide to Ukraine's president says the price cap should be around 30 in order to hit Russia's economy harder. Matt Hancock has revealed he was warned that COVID-19 could kill hundreds of thousands of people in the UK two months before the country was placed under lockdown. In his new book, the former health secretary said the chief medical officer for England, Professor Chris Whitty, informed him in January 2020 that in the worst case scenario, 820,000 could die. The independent MP for West Suffolk made his first appearance in the House of Commons yesterday after taking part in ITV's I'm a Celebrity show in Australia. A company that makes plastic alternative packaging from seaweed has become the first UK winner of Prince William's Earthshot Prize. Knopla is one of five entrepreneurs who've been awarded a million pounds to scale up their green innovation projects. The Prince of Wales says the Earthshot solutions prove we can overcome climate change and change our future. And today marks 30 years since the first ever text message was sent. One in three people still, and, still send and receive SMS messages every day. And 20% of us still use SMS as their default messaging platform. The first text was sent by engineer Neil Papworth in December 1992. It read, Merry Christmas. And he told GB News he didn't know it would turn into something so big. Instead of carrying around a clunky analogue phone and a pager on their hip, you would you'll be able to combine those two devices and you know a secretary or something could send a message to to a guy that, that that's on the road and you know that that's pretty much what we thought about back then but we had no idea it was gonna turn into the monster it is today that's for sure this is gb news we're bringing more news as it happens now let's get back to esther and philip
Thanks there, Bethany. Now, to look through the papers today, we're joined by political commentator Claire Purcell and local government editor of Conservative Home, Harry Fibb. So we'll start with you, Claire. What is your story? Well, I think it's the strep A mm. bacterial infection that is uh, going around schools quite rapidly has killed six children already. And when you delve into the story a little bit further, it does seem as though lockdown has played a part in the rise of this infection. It's always been around. It's always been one of those things that children have managed to catch and can shift it quite quickly. But because they haven't been subjected to the amount of viruses and bugs that they would normally have through those sort of couple of years of lockdown, it just means that it's grabbing a hold of them and is turning into something really quite serious. And schools are having clusters of them. And I think what we all need to now worry about is what measures are likely to be taken, preventative antibiotic treatment for all children. That doesn't seem a great way to go. Closing schools, closing things like water fountains. Those children have suffered quite a lot throughout the past few years, and I don't think that we can really go back down this road again. And it does sort of make you wonder, is this a cost of those lockdowns? So I think, you know, part of the COVID inquiry also needs to look at this. It's really quite serious. For something that is a mild infection for most, it can turn into something quite serious. But the symptoms are so similar to a common cold that pretty much anybody can get it. So I think that we are in some really worrying times. And I, you, you never want to hear of children dying of something that is preventable. And also, I'll say, later on in the show, we've got Oxford professor Carl Hennigan coming on to explain about this. He was somebody at the very start when he said, if you go into lockdown, oh. all of these bugs that we catch and have every day and we get immunity to, we will not get, and children will be incredibly vulnerable. I think also report uh, admissions to hospital for the under fives is up to a factor of 20 with the flu. I mean, we have got serious... Because they never got any of this immunity. Removing all the things like fountains is probably a negative thing to do as well. They've got yeah. to catch these bugs, haven't they? And that's the point. If you're not subjected to these kind of bugs, then you're not going to get any sort of natural immunity to it. So I think, you know, the more the kids can go outside, play in the dirt and all things like that, has got to be good for them. And it's the thing that we're now keeping them away from. Mm. Phil? Uh, well, this, the big story of the week I want to talk about, because I think it was really important, it ha actually happened at Prime Minister's Questions. Um, earlier this week on Wednesday, and uh, let's, just, let's just see a clip of, of, of PMQs. Mr Speaker, Winchester College has a rowing club, a rifle club, an extensive art collection. They charge over £45,000 a year in fees. Why did he hand them nearly £6 million of taxpayers' money this year in what his levelling up secretary calls egregious state support? Yeah. Now, the reason I wanted to, um, to highlight that was I found this a very worrying development in politics. Um, and I'd be interested to know uh, what you all think. Because uh, I'll repeat again what Keir Starmer said there. He was talking about uh, Winchester College and the fact that the government doesn't charge VAT on private school fees that Keir Starmer wants to start doing. Now, people may or may not agree with that policy. That's a, you know, that's a different debate. But the words that he used in that, in that statement were, I found very troubling. He said, why did the Prime Minister hand them nearly £6 million of taxpayers' money this year? Now, of course, the government didn't hand no. schools £6 million of taxpayers' money this year. They just didn't tax them the VAT on the school fees, which would have raised £6 million. Yeah. And what really troubles me about this is this growing trend within politics, and particularly in the left of politics, although sometimes it's difficult to differentiate uh, between the parties on these things is that it's an attitude of politicians that is that every single penny that people earn is the government's, and it's for the government to then decide whether or not they should be, be <laughs> benign enough to hand some of it back to us, rather than treating money as if we've earned it and it's ours, and it's the, then whether the government takes it off us or not. So a benevolent this, state this is now, allowing and, you and to and keep your I money. I find this shift in attitude... Very, very troubling that Keir Starmer said there that, in effect, he thinks that uh, if you don't tax somebody, that means that that's the government handing you some money back. And I think I think people should be worried about that. And, and you see, because it was all um, inflammatory language about what certain schools were getting, you lost that message. But that was the sinister underlying message that I know certainly worried you. As you say, if you're not being taxed, then um, then you're you're getting a freebie. No, exactly. no, wrong way round, Keir. Really? That's yeah. right. It is our money, we and we hand be, over tax to you. We should all be very afraid. Yes. 
yes, I think be, we very be very afraid. afraid. I think that's I think that's um, spot on, and I think that the, uh, the the mentality that we start from all money belongs to the state, and then it's a huge treat if we're allowed to have any of our money, and it's and it's alarming, not just that. The, the leader of the opposition, who you know, as many expect to become the prime minister, would say that, but also that it went um, so unchallenged. Yes, um, yes, but, but unchallenged but, it was. But I also think that um, the what we should be doing is is trying to make it more affordable for people to go to independent schools, and rather than rather than say they're sort of villains and have this have this class war, recognise that certainly in the past many people would have given up um, foreign holidays and scrimped and scraped for the for the for the fees that, that many of them would have got scholarships, and so wouldn't necessarily be rich. And what we should be trying to do is look at the things that happened before, like the uh, assisted places scheme and the direct grant scheme, so that the people who if if they, the, the local state school is not good uh, and they decide they, they, they're, they're going to make an effort to try and find an alternative, it should be easier for them rather than saying that <laughs> rather than saying we're going to we're going to make it harder and close it down altogether. Choice, choice is what yeah. we believe in your story there, Harry. Um, so I, uh, it's still going strong in the papers today about um, Lady Lady Susan um, Hussey, who I think's been um, uh, uh, traduced. Um, Charles Moore had a, had a piece in The Telegraph saying, well, look, either um, uh, Ngozi uh, Fulani had a, uh, a tape recording of this and, uh, at, at the Buckingham Palace reception and so, was, in other words, was going in a very odd way looking to be offended, um, or she was relying on her memory, in which case, you know, how, how reliable is the, um, you know, is, is, is the transcript, as it, as it was called. And I think a lot uh, with these conversations about the tone and the wording of, you know, where are you from, where are you from originally, where, you know, that, that it actually makes, actually makes quite a lot of difference. But the other thing is uh, that, that struck me as... Uh, uh, astonishing about this is that the uh, um, charity uh, uh, Sister Space of uh, um, uh, Ngozi Fulani is uh, a, a charity that, that only helps black people. And if you're Asian or white, or apparently there was a case of somebody who's mixed race, um, you know they get they get turned away because it's. Uh, uh, a, a sort of a black separatist, uh, you know, like a sort of an apartheid system. So who's the real racist in, the, in this story? I mean, that that again is something that um, people people seem to somehow have got used to accepting this this uh, this racial well, there's division. Certainly, certainly, interesting points that have been brought up following this. As you say, you know, what is the challenge? What is the accuracy? Was it wrong? And, you know, obviously, uh, Lady Susie's work, we're absolutely clumsy. There's no way you could say that. What was her job? Job and she didn't do it right. But I think you're right, lots of further questions are going to come out now, aren't they? Do you think she was treated badly? Lady I do, Hussie. actually, I do. Um, my immediate thought when I saw the story was, oh, that's awful, she shouldn't have said that. But when you delve down into the detail of it, they're at a reception. This is an 83-year-old lady who perhaps is not great at hearing, and we've all met people like that, who did ask a question a few times. I think it, what's more important is the intent behind it. If somebody is there in a national costume, national dress, you are going to ask where they're from. Otherwise, they wouldn't be wearing it. And I do find it a little bit worrying if the recording was happening, if a, a phone was in a pocket on record. Why? Why would you do that? Well, that's What's why I think this will unravel. And I think it is... It. What we, you see, and this always happens, doesn't it, in the media? You hear one version, a bit Absolutely. like in life, and then you start to hear the others. Well, I'll give you another version of something, and I thought this was a rather interesting piece uh, this week. And uh, Ellie Mollison is her name, and she uh, runs a campaign group, which is Her Game 2. So she wants to make football grounds better spaces for uh, women to go to. So she said, I went to Qatar, and I was so worried what it was going to be like. Like. I took my dad as my chaperone, thinking it's going to be awful. She said, oh, my goodness, I couldn't have been farther from the truth. It was fantastic. All the fans were together. There was less wolf whistling. There was less harassment. Nothing was going on. So she's now saying, isn't it time to make sure that we don't drink at all at stadiums? Could we not learn from the positivity that went on there? And I see that Mark Roberts, the chief constable for Cheshire, uh, said on the football policing, said the atmosphere had been passionate and friendly, similar to the women's Euro 2022 final. So I thought there everybody was complaining at the very start. What an outrage. You couldn't drink at the stadiums. And now people are saying, do you know what? It had a different atmosphere and it was positive. So again, we all, don't we, jump to one <laughs> side of the story only to unravel a little bit later. It has been striking how all the fans have sat amongst each other, rival supporters all sat amongst each other, which had never happened.
in an no. English football stadium where they all have to be segregated and all the rest of it. And so I think there, there might be something in that. I don't Take think so. I'm maybe slightly partial in this debate. But I think there is... I think there might be something in that. Harry? I think so, yes. I, I like to take a, a, a liberal approach and that, you know, if people, if people are, are, are drinking in a responsible and enjoyable um, uh, way, then, then why not? And only, you know, you only um, uh, punish, punish people, you know, if and when they start to behave badly. But, you know, of course you've got to look at... Uh, the, you know, the, the practical results of, of, of trying out different, different things. So I think you yeah, have to take an open mind. Yeah. Well, thank you both. We'll see you back at 11 o'clock with more stories from the papers. But coming up on the show, we'll be joined in the studio by Immigration Minister Robert Jenrick and we'll be asking him the questions uh, that you have been sending in. So don't go anywhere. We are GB News, and we'd like to say thank you to each and every one of you for bringing us your conversations, for helping our great nation find its voice. We are here for you on radio, television and online across England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. It's not the BBC, you know, you actually get your facts right. We are proud to be GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Monday to Thursday, 9 p.m. till 11 p.m. Join me, Dan Wooten. I'll bring you the sharpest takes and hottest debates. Do you okay. not believe in prisons? I, I don't believe in prisons. I'm completely right. stunned. I guarantee you there'll be no spin, no bias, no censorship. I actually was personally quite offended by it. <gasps> and no reason to go to bed. So I guess they've always been quite woke. That's Dan Wooten tonight on TV, radio and online. Monday to Thursday from 9 p.m. till 11 p.m. on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Hello there, it's Eamon Holmes here from Breakfast on GB News. We're not just on your television and your screens, you know. We're on DAB Plus Digital Radio, so you can listen to your favourite shows on the move. If you've not yet listened to GB News Radio, it's very simple. We're on your radio player and tune in apps. On your smart speaker, phone or tablet, or online at gbnews.uk. Take us with you wherever you go. GB News Radio. You never have to miss a moment of the People's Channel. Join me every Sunday at 6 p.m. for Gloria Meets. In exclusive interviews, I'll be finding out who our politicians really are and what they really think. It's something that you would never want anyone to suffer. I didn't know what channels there were. B, I didn't think I'd be believed. I must have weighed about seven stone and I'm five foot eight. My instincts was to sort of cover this up. I mean, clearly that was a mistake. Join me every Sunday at 6 p.m. on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's news channel. Welcome back to the show. We're now joined in the studio by Minister of State for Immigration, Robert Jenrick. Robert, thank you for joining us. Good morning. Um, our viewers have been sending in lots of questions that they want to post to us, which we will, we will certainly get around to doing. I wanted to break it down into two sections, really. The first is the legal immigration before we move on to the illegal stuff coming over the channel mm. by dinghy. In terms of legal immigration, the, the last year we saw June 2021 to June 2022... 504,000 net migration, which was bigger than even when we had free movement of people That's right. in the EU. I mean, can we start with a simple agreement that that figure is too high? It's uh, far too high. And it needs to come down. Absolutely. So looking at those figures, um, people who came to work was 150,000, students were 277,000, and other, including refugees, were 276,000. The figure that struck me here was about students and how many students are coming and their dependents. Mm. Now, in terms of dependents, 476,000 students came in total, bringing 116,000 dependents. From Nigeria, 50,000 students came, bringing in over 51,000 dependents. Mm. Why do we allow students to bring in dependents? Mm. Well, we've got very liberal rules, if you like, on students bringing their family members with them. And that is something that we are interested in reviewing. It's right that if you came here to do a PhD and were staying in the UK for a long time, that you might be able to bring your spouse with you. But the figures that you just quoted and the ones that I've seen in the last few weeks in this job suggest that the problem is much bigger than that. 
And what I'm concerned about is there are people coming to universities here as a backdoor way of bringing their families into the UK and staying here for a prolonged period. Because although the majority of students do leave the country at the end of their studies, 40% don't. And so a very significant number of people use this as a route to a life in the UK. And this is a big driver of net migration. And we can all see that there might be some benefits to that, to the economy and to society. But I start from the point that we're a relatively small country. There is a lack of housing. Public services are under considerable strain at the moment. We can't have a million people entering the country in a single year, uh, and a net migration of half a million. And all our It's viewers, just not sustainable. And all our viewers will agree with this separately. It's not really a question now, but maybe a point to take back. There has to be reform of the universities if it's their way of funding themselves. They're too big, too many people are going there, and it seems now that this is their source of income without thinking of the implications to the country as a whole and the immigration figures. That's something the mm. government must take I away. Th I think that's right. I mean, we've got a flourishing university sector. That's a good thing. We are a world leader in education. But there are a subset of universities which are surviving almost entirely um, on international students. And that is putting huge pressure on the UK. So, and we have to try to change that. So what our viewers want to know is what are the government going to do to get this figure down and to stop all these people, particularly from countries like Nigeria, using it as a backdoor way to bring in their family members? Well, Rishi Sunak, the Prime Minister, and Suella Braverman, the Home Secretary, and I are reviewing this. We've only been in our jobs for four weeks, and we haven't come to firm conclusions. But I think all three of us are agreed that net migration of 500,000 is wrong, that is unsustainable, and we have to work together to bring it down. And some of the areas that are ripe for reform include looking at the number of students coming into the UK and how easy it is for them to bring dependents here. You, you do have to remember when you look at the stats that half of those people are humanitarian visas. And so there were almost 250,000 people entering the UK last year from a combination of Ukraine, Afghanistan, Syria, and also the Hong yeah. Kong scheme. Broadly, that's a good thing. But you've got to remember when you make those big, bold, compassionate steps. It has consequences, yeah. and that is the largest number of people entering the UK and, in and a single year since the Second World War. And I will get onto that, because in The Times today, it talked about this two-tier asylum system to clear the migrant backlog of 150,000. It was talking about a faster route for some of these people, people from, uh, you know, the, the countries that you talk about, and I was slightly wary of that because it said they wouldn't be then going for a second set of interviews. So this two-tier system, can you tell us a little bit more about it? Because on first read in the papers today, I had a lot of questions in my mind. Well, that's speculation, so I can't comment on that story in particular. We do need to get this backlog down. You know, we now have a huge backlog of asylum cases that built up over the pandemic for reasons that... <laughs> It's hard to explain. I think it's a combination of poor management and very low productivity in the Home Office. We've got to tackle that. We've gone from having a Home Office decision maker making four or five decisions per person per week to one. We're going to be recruiting more people, getting better management in, and trying to get well, those Well, that's what through. we'd want to hear, more people doing it properly. What we don't want to hear is a faster system, an amnesty system, a quicker no, we're, system, we're, and interviews not being we're, done. We're very clear. We're not going to do an amnesty. We're not going to compromise on security or all the things the British public would expect. There are some countries where we have extremely high grant rates, and so it would be sensible to say that they have perhaps a lighter touch process than those where it's highly likely that they'll be rejected because we've got to get the backlog down. But we're not going to create an amnesty like John Reid did when he was Home Secretary under the last Labour government when you saw the Home Office once again failing to tackle this issue and having a very high backlog. Now, in terms of the illegal immigration that drives us crackers, it drives our viewers crackers about all these dinghies and small boats coming over from France. And that's primarily yeah, most of the that, questions. And that is, that's what most of our viewers wanted to, us to focus on. Um, lots of people say, why are we not just turning these boats round and sending them back to France? Well, I can understand that, and that's what people say to me every day since I've started doing this job. The issue is that we're a party to international treaties that prevent us from doing that. The channel has no international waters. It goes from French waters to a median line where it immediately falls into UK waters. 
if we push the boats back into French waters, then we're immediately in breach of those treaties and the French would have a serious issue with that. We've tried to negotiate with the French and the Home Secretary signed uh, a deal just a few weeks ago, which is an improvement on the situation, but it isn't the answer. It's certainly not a silver bullet. It does mean that there'll be more French officers on the beaches intercepting boats, but arrests are low and it doesn't seem to break the people smugglers' business. So we're clearly going to have to go much further than that. Some of that will be diplomatic, and Rishi Sunak seems to have built a good rapport with President Macron, but a lot of it's going to be harder edged than that. It's going to be using well, our National Crime it, Agency, Police, Security Services, GCHQ to go upstream and really tackle and our, these gangs. And our viewers think, oh, gosh, not more tens of million pounds going to France, which isn't doing anything. It's mm -hmm. like we're being fobbed off with this story that this can uh, happen. And it's not... That, that, having said that, Alexander Downer came on the show and that mm -hmm. was... Uh, he was uh, minister at the time in Australia when he, he curbed a lot of the immigration. He said, you do have to do everything. You ha will have to negotiate with France. You'll have to do anything. But I'm afraid we're just not seeing that being enough. So, you know, what about coming out of the uh, ECHR. What are we going to do? What are we going to do with our own sort of bill of rights? How are we going to get that so we have got the legal authority to turn things around? Are we going to do that as uh, the government? Well, Alexander Downer is right that this is a campaign on many fronts and you've just got to go at it from every possible angle. I think we will need more legislation to sharpen up our laws here because the system isn't just broken, it's in danger of becoming obsolete. Our whole immigration system was created after the Second World War in an entirely different era, looking at the, the, the Holocaust and the horrors that happened in Europe. Treaties like the ECHR, the Refugee Convention were signed. Today is a totally different world where an Albanian could get a Wizz Air flight from Tirana to Brussels, get a bus to Calais and then pay a few thousand pounds so to get what, across the channel. So what's the likelihood that it's going to be emergency legislation, something that David Davis is calling through to get this through quickly? Well, we are working through what we think is the best route here. I can't tell you today on the show, but all I can say is that every day, Suella Braverman and myself are working through what that legislation might look like. We're constantly speaking to the Prime Minister. We think that this is a problem that could be with us for many years to come. Mass migration is going to be one of the stories of the 21st century. And so we have to recreate our immigration system so that it's fit for purpose. That will mean creating a system where deterrence is suffused through the whole thing. Oh. And, and to me, that means that you should not get a route to life in the UK if you come here illegally. There will be policies like Rwanda at the heart of it, and I hope that we can enact that as soon as it gets through the British courts. It will also mean looking at how we treat people on arrival so that nobody thinks that coming to the UK is a soft touch and the UK is not a, a better site for asylum shoppers than our EU neighbours. Our, our viewers will want to hear that this is going to be a problem that's with us for years to come. They're hoping the government's going to solve it. Well, one, my, one my, the... my point is, Phil, is that mass migration is going to be one of the stories of the 21st century. There's going to be hundreds of millions of people on the move all around the world, and so we have to prepare our immigration system so that we can tackle that. It's well, not a question of just, this might be a fleeting challenge, that's why I think very serious reform of the system is necessary, and that's the kind of legislation that Suella and I are looking at. Uh, uh, Esther mentioned about the European Court of Human Rights. Why, do, why, do we, why don't we ignore their rulings? I mean, when they, when they said that uh, prisoners must have the right to vote, the last Labour government and subsequent Conservative governments just ignored that ruling, said we don't, we don't accept it. And well, we the, government, the government did actually, why, in the end, why, uh, allow why, some prisoners... Why, why don't vote, we... Why don't I, we, I'm not defending that. Why, they ignored it for years, that ruling. Why do we not do the same when it comes to these rulings on kicking out people? To, to well, as long like as we're around. a party to the ECHR, I think we have to live up to its standards. And there are those who would say that the ECHR is a British achievement it's an important part of our architecture of human rights in the world. However, I do think, at the point I made a moment ago, 
those treaties were creating a totally different environment. Uh, we've got to and get we are two, beginning to think that they we've are We've got to get two, two more qu quick questions in. One of them, which lots of people are up in arms on, why haven't you done more about Albania? Mm. Why aren't the thousands and thousands, fundamentally, of men coming over from a safe country, why aren't they on a plane going back which ASAP? Which is what all the countries do. And, and I see here... send them back, and I straight see, away. Straight away. And I see that uh, the Prime Minister is in negotiations, again, in the time today with the president, um, the leader of uh, Albania. But our viewers want to know, why aren't they number one priority being sent back? They are our number one priority. Albania is a demonstrably safe country. It is very hard to see how an Albanian should be able to successfully claim asylum here in the UK. We have a returns agreement, which was signed a year ago, and a 1,000 Albanians have gone back already. But that's small fry compared to the numbers crossing the channel. We're looking at what we can do there. You're right to say we're also pursuing the diplomatic channels with Eddie Rama, uh, the Albanian leader. And I think you'll have to watch this space. OK, but well, the principle that, that needs we, to be The principle that, needs that we to be come quick. from okay, that is needs that to be quick, a safe country like Albania should be excluded from the right to claim uh, asylum. And the other one has to be uh, about people being put up in hotels. Yes, I mean, lots of yes. people here, uh, Stephanie, Tony, Caroline, there's literally loads of people have said that, that what makes them really annoyed Annette. is that people are coming to lovely Alan. hotel rooms, mm. getting the food and everything provided for them, all the rest of it, four-star hotels, and yet there's homeless people, veterans... Yeah who were out on the streets. Mm -hmm. Tony, particularly about veterans, it be Stephanie, about veterans. Exactly. How can it be justified that these people get fast-tracked into a four-star hotel mm -hmm. and people who have served our country are on the streets and are at the bottom of the queue? Well, I agree. I mean, it's not justifiable. It's disgusting. Members of the public are outraged at the thought of this amount of money being wasted on hotels. What we've got to do is obviously tackle the problem itself. This is a symptom of the problem, not the cause. But what I want to do is get people out of the hotels and into simple sites where they're in decent but never luxurious accommodation. But, and we are already identifying those sites, and I hope we'll be able to say more in the coming but weeks. But you must know and you must reassure our viewers that the clock is ticking. There's no point saying I've only been in for four weeks or whatever. People say, no, you've been in government for years and years and years. And the urgency, we must need to do that. And I wonder if that is why, again, reading in the papers, uh, Rishi Sunak, the Prime Minister, seems to have now become the Home Secretary as well and moved Suella aside as he takes control. It's so important to the country. No, that's not right. He's working very closely with Suella. They formed a good partnership. They're meeting at least once a week for long periods to go through these issues. But it is correct to say that Rishi has identified this as one of the two or three top priorities. And he has spent a lot of time in the last month understanding the sheer complexity of the issue, formulating policies. And you're going to be hearing more in the coming weeks. We want to tackle this. We know that as a Conservative Party, securing our borders is absolutely key. It's the first priority of any government and we are going to tackle this in the months ahead. One word answer. Andy from Brightling C says, does the minister agree that failing to control migration will certainly lose the Conservatives the next election if they don't fix it? Yes. Thank you. Thank you for joining us, Robert. Thank you. This, See, this a one-word answer from <laughs> yes. a politician who'd have thought it, and, you know, a, a straight uh, answer there as well. And thank you to everybody who's, uh, who's written in with those questions. Thank you. Now, according to the latest YouGov Car 26 poll, 57% of people want to delay or cancel the ban on sales of new petrol and diesel vehicles from 2030. Director of Car26, Lois Perry, said the polls showed that government policy on net zero is completely out of touch with the public, and we're delighted to say that she joins us now to tell us more. So tell us more about this poll. Who's taken part of the poll? What did they say? Was there age differences in it, geographic differences in it? Tell us who's taken part. Well, um, there was about 1,500 people that were polled by YouGov um, across all the age ranges and Brexiteers and Remainers and uh, everybody, basically. And, uh, yeah, 57% of those expressed an opinion want to either delay or cancel the ban. So nobody wants it. Well, people do want it, but the vast majority don't want it. But what was very interesting, Esther, was that young people who previously have been really pro the ban coming in in 2030, that's actually dropped from last year, 72%. 
to 51% this year. Now, we're being constantly told that young people are really pro net zero and they love it. And this is showing that that's not the case at all. I mean, I'm why, surprised... Why do you think it's, it, it's moved so significantly in the last year? And why do you think it's lots of young people who are now saying, oh, rethink these policies? Well, I think young people are seeing the impact. You know, they're seeing that the cost of living is going up and it's actually impacting on them. Young people live on uh, electronic devices and the price of electricity is going absolutely through the roof because we don't frack. We pay eight times more for our electricity. But the, I actually think that there's a bit of a disconnect between what the mainstream media tell us and th what's actually happening in real life. We're being constantly told by the BBC certain things about everybody loving net zero, but actually I don't think it's the case in the real world. Mm. Our and and probably who they're listening to. I mean, that's it, isn't it? Everybody has a, a, a self-selective audience. Absolutely. And if they're not absolutely tapping into all the regions, all the people, all sort of uh, socio-economic backgrounds. This is the disparity here in the results, isn't it? No, absolutely. And if you look at our polling last week that we, uh, that we did with regards to a net zero referendum, it's actually 62% want a net zero referendum. And again, 56% uh, of young people, 18 to 24, last year, wanted a net zero referendum, and that went up this year to 78%. We're not hearing that at all, are um, we? It's ridiculous. I, mean, I agree. I think the, the silent majority realised that net zero is futile and, and because of what's happening around the world, it won't make any difference. But on this re referendum thing, I mean, what question would you ask in, in a referendum? Well, you could certainly ask the question, should we have a pause on net zero policies whilst there's a... Um, a, a a cost-benefit analysis being carried out because that actually hasn't been done at all. It's ridiculous. And also, while sorry, while China are building coal-fired power stations, why should we be pursuing net, net zero no, no, policies I, at all? I, I, I mean, I agree. I mean, I voted against the Climate Change Act in 2008. Good for I mean, you. Right? So it's all this, <laughs> Maybe I think, that is, could be the question. Other, it, should we but, revoke the Climate Change but, Act? But, the que but what I don't understand about the referendum thing is if you say, you know, should we have net zero and people vote no in a referendum, yeah. the bit I don't understand is what then the government is mandated to do because if if you then wanted to pursue a policy not because of net zero but for some other reason that would reduce carbon emissions would well, then, they would they be banned from doing so because the public had voted against a net zero? Well, then you could have as part of the question uh, whether CO two reduction policies should be pursued at all. That could be part of the question yeah. whether but, that should actually be the end goal in actual fact at all because our organisation doesn't believe that CO2 has any ne negative impact on the environment or climate change whatsoever. But what I think this will do, it will encourage debate. There's been no debate whatsoever. Uh, There's been no scientists debating each other on television. There's been nothing I think, at all. I think that's what I was going to ask you. Whilst you're saying the headline is, we want a referendum, yeah. is it really a referendum or is it just greater conversation and understanding Standing, if you go for this policy, mm. policy in a short time frame, the consequences of this, a bit like we'll be speaking to Professor Carl Hennigan a bit later, did people really know the downsides of lockdown? You're saying the same thing. Do people really know the downsides mm. of this policy? So it won't be a referendum. It's just stop and pause and think what you're doing. Absolutely. Stop, pause and reflect and actually have a look at the science and allow the science to be debated. I mean, the BBC actually have a policy that there's, there's not allowed to be any debate whatsoever on anything to do with the climate science and we all know from covid that modeling is totally way out a lot of the time this whole thing has been based on modeling and if they push us all into electric vehicles if you actually look, actually look at what's going on in switzerland at the moment they've announced yesterday that electric cars are going to be banned from the roads when there's power shortages or when the, you know there's pressure on the grid so it's understand lois you brought a, a brilliant point to the forefront and i think understanding what uh, we're heading towards is really i important. think the public are way ahead of politicians on this as they usually are <laughs> yeah absolutely and, like and, with brexit uh, exactly absolutely and so thank you for joining us and putting these issues out there for people to, to hear. I'm sure pe lots of people agree with you. And they'll you be, I'm sure they'll be emailing us in. Well, we've all been gifted the worst advent calendar this year with a tally of strikes announced by health workers, firefighters, teachers, lecturers, civil servants and transport, postal and security workers. Do you know what, Phil? It probably would have been easier for me to say who was well, still it? working, but never mind. Exactly. Downing Street have urged unions to call off the industrial action over the festive season. But a lack of intervention may mean Britain is in for another winter of discontent. Here to discuss this is trade unionist and firefighter Paul Embry. Paul, thank you for joining us. I mean, how, how much of this strike action is actually industrial and how much of it is 
political? Well, I don't think any of it is political in a true sense. I mean, the idea that millions of workers have suddenly woken up one morning and thought, uh, we're going to take industrial action because, because we want to bring down the, the Conservative government is obviously not true. I mean, what we're seeing is, is a result of circumstance as a result of the economic landscape um, that is facing millions of workers at the moment in terms of the cost of living crisis, in terms of people struggling to pay their energy bills, their mortgages, worried about buying their kids Christmas presents, etc. Um, and people, I think, simply have reached the end of their tether. You know, they, they were told in 2008 that they had to pay the price for an economic crisis they didn't create, the global financial crisis. They're now being told again that they've got to pay that price in terms of real terms pay cuts. And there comes a point where, where workers simply say, actually, that's not a price I'm prepared to pay anymore. And if you insist that I do, I'm going to take action about it. Yeah, I mean, look, everyone wants to be paid more. I'm not aware of anybody who doesn't want to be paid more. But, you know, there's lots of the average salary in the UK is about £28,000 a year. There's people going on strike here, train drivers. Average pay of a train driver, I was reading last night, is £57,067. Lots of people, nurses, lecturers, all have salaries, average salaries above the national average salary. Is it really justifiable? If, of course, they want to be paid more, and we understand that everybody wants to be paid more and that times are tough for everybody, but is it really fair for them to be asking for higher pay from taxpayers, most of whom are earning much less than them? Well, I, I would rephrase the question. Is it fair that people should continue to suffer economic hardship? You know, we've had 14 years of sluggish economic growth and paltry pay increases. And is it fair that we're insisting that, that people continue to take real terms pay cuts um, at a time where they're struggling to make ends meet? And I have to say, Philip, the, the truth is that not everybody is struggling, actually. We've still got a fundamentally unfair economy. <laughs> in this country. There are people at the top who did very nicely throughout the pandemic. We see city bonuses surging, for example. We see executive pay rising quite handsomely. We see some of our corporations registering record profits. We've got a government that sees fit to lift the, camp, the cap on bankers' bonuses. And, and workers can actually see this going on and think, well, hold on well, a second, I'm, well, suffering, well, I'm suffering a wage well, squeeze, well, which is, is actually the worst since Napoleonic times, and this simply isn't fair. Yeah, but that, that's, that's all very well, Paul. But, I mean, look at the railways as a prime example. You know, they've got some of the most outdated, ludicrous, idiotic working practices that are known to mankind. You've got 12-minute time allowances for a 60-second walk. You've got a policy where lunch has to be restarted. If a boss talks to you, even if he just says, comes across and says hello to you while you're having lunch, your lunch hour starts from scratch again. Um, you can't roster an individual to do a one-person task. You've got to roster a whole team. It's like carry on at your convenience from the 1970s. And the government and the railways have said, look, if you deal with some of these restrictive and ridiculous, outdated working practices, you can have your pay rise. And yet the unions refuse to even accept them. So it seems to me that maybe the pay rise isn't actually that important if they're still clinging on to these ludicrous working practices. Well, even if some of that stuff is true, and I'm, I'm quite sure the RMT has actually refuted some of, of those suggestions and have a, have a completely different take on it, um, I don't really accept that that kind of justifies any employer. And I don't think we necessarily need to focus just on the railways because this industrial um, reaction that we're seeing is spread across many sectors. I don't think it's an argument to say, well, it's a reason for us to hold down your pay. Um, the reality is, yes, of course, it's right and it's proper that, that trade unions should get into to discussions on improving, modernising working practices and so on. Um, but the idea that they should be blackmailed and told, well, even during a cost of living crisis, when inflation is running at 10, 11%, at we're going to hold down your pay and only offer you, in my case, as a firefighter, 5%, for example, um, that that somehow is justified, I simply don't accept. I mean, I think people ultimately have got to realise this isn't just about oh. so-called... But can just yeah. uh, uh, diff I'm going to come from a different tack here, and I want to uh, also explain. It's Paul Embry. I know just before we said Professor Carl Hennigan. He's <laughs> on a bit later. Yeah. This is Paul Embry. I just want to uh, get that right. See, the, we do have a problem, and I think, yeah, you're now, you're now a professor. Uh, but, um, look, we have a problem, and the problem and how we solve it, you know, I guess it's going to be this. There is no more money 
and we've all got to understand this, where is the money coming from? And some people say, well, what you do is you squeeze the rich people even more because they should be paying more and they, you know, whatever it is. But the reality is we've got to work out how this is going to work. So somebody like me who's on the trains, the train strike has been so bad for regular working people. They're not using the trains anymore. You're losing millions of pounds a day, so that's money that isn't going to go to the workers. They're now using cars. They're not going to go back on the railways. We are destroying industries because you think you're going to get more money. I was even looking at the health sector. 250,000 people paid for their surgery this year because of the delays. You've got private now, people taking sort of private insurance. What I'm saying is strike action is going to destroy your sectors rather than getting round the table and saying, what can we afford and how do we help people? Well, well, people always say that. People who oppose unions always say that strike action doesn't work. And the reality is, quite often, it does work. And of course, you know, it should never be a first resort. It should always be a last resort. But when, as in my case, in the fire and rescue service, for example, the union has, in, has engaged in months and months of negotiations, and the employers say, actually, this is all you're worth. This is all gonna, you're going to get. There is no more money on the table. And then at some point, you have to either just accept that and cave in, or you have to say, well, we're prepared to take industrial action over it. I mean, I don't accept, actually, that there isn't. I mean, I, at the top of the, the interview, I outlined some of the people who have done very nicely. Uh, in recent years, um, you know, we did, for example, this huge scope for a, a wealth tax in this country, we could we could apply a wealth tax, which potentially raises billions to be able to fund our public services and give people a decent pay increase. I mean, there's a broader argument there as a sovereign currency issue in country. There's no reason, frankly, why we should ever be short of money. And we saw that during the COVID crisis, for example, that suddenly we were able yeah. to find billions of pounds Paul, when it mattered. I don't see why we shouldn't be able to do that now to give people a decent pay increase. Paul Embry, thank you very much indeed for joining us. And I do hope you will join us again because there's so much to talk about here. You know, uh, I looked at sort of the NHS spending and how it's gone from 105 billion in 2010 and it's now up to for, uh, planned spending this year, 190 billion. So we've doubled the money into the NHS. And if you keep saying tax people and the windfall tax, you're now seeing those companies are moving out of the country. You can't keep taxing people and think there isn't going to be a consequence. So. So Chris Whitty and Patrick Valance have said that Britain is in for a prolonged period of high death rates. Uh, shouldn't we have been warned of the consequences of lockdown before we went into it? Joining us now is Director of the University of Oxford Centre for Evidence-Based Medicine, Professor Carl Hennigan. Carl, thank you so much for joining us. What, what did you make of, uh, of Chris Whitty and Patrick Valance saying that we were going for this prolonged period of excess deaths because of... Uh, the effects of the lockdown. Did, did you have the same level of incredulity that I did, that they'd had the brass neck to say it, to be perfectly honest? Well, well uh, just listening to your last call, you said, you, you said there is no money. Well, there was some money. There was £370 billion, and actually we threw it away in the pandemic, and now we're paying the consequences of that. I think what this report goes to is what we're seeing across the board now. We've seen Matt Hancock also coming out. Is people providing defensive positions to say, it wasn't me, I'm not to blame. And this report says, look, there were lots of collateral issues out there, but actually at the time, nobody was talking about them. So for you right, they're saying, well, look, actually when we decided to prioritise COVID, we let cancer care, uh, heart disease care, basically go out the window. But particularly there's one aspect in this report which I find most shocking is the impact on educational sec settings. And it says the in restrictions it must be heavily caveated with the health and well-being impact of limiting attendance in educational attendance settings. Whole raft of problems that occurred such as an 80% increase in the number of referrals to child and adolescent mental health. Huge impact. But you know what at the time? Nobody cared. And in addition, when we did go into lockdown, people didn't say, look, we've got to come out of this as quick as we can because of the huge societal impact, the impact on the economy, well-being, and all of this was ignored. Therefore, what I think is happening now is people are taking defensive positions. And the problem with that is we're going to learn nothing. And that, to me, is a huge missed opportunity. And I am concerned about the direction of travel that we're not prepared to say we made a lot of mistakes. We need to do something differently, particularly next time.
Yeah, and we're seeing now on the front pages of the papers that there were mistakes. We're looking now, alert after strep A kills six uh, children. So there's issues now for young children who don't seem to have a robust immune system because they were locked away for two years. We're hearing about 20 times the number of ch young children being admitted into hospital with the flu. Yeah, no, it's interesting. I'll give you a little sort of story that I tell when, when a person turns up with their first child and they turn up with their first viral illness to me as a GP. I generally say, look, in a lifetime, you're going to face about 200 viruses. And in early years, there's going to be a considerable number of those that build up your immune system, which is a normal part of the development of a child to be healthy and go into the world. The problem is if you put a two to three year gap into that, you have a huge burden of people who are now going to have children coming forward who have a missing bit of their immunity. So we're seeing rises in RSV in under fives. That's increasing in hospital admissions. We're seeing rises in influenza in those five to 14. And then you're right, the bit about the scarlet fever, the bit that's concerning is scarlet fever has been on the rise. We've had a two year pause. So the numbers are high but not at that high as 2017-18. But what's concerning is the number of deaths we've heard, the six deaths in children, are very high. And that's a major concerning bit right now that we have to be worried about. I think there are three issues that, that play into that. One is that parents need to be aware of what's going on and understand if their child's unwell, particularly if they have anxiety, that the child must be seen and must be seen face to face. I have concerns about the 111 system because all across the board, I hear people saying it's difficult to get through, the delays are significant. And then third, I think just like we had a vaccine task force, right now, we need an emergency urgent care task force to get on top of the problem. And I am incredibly concerned as we go into December, because we were talking in the last call, I just think this is the wrong time now. I get why people need pay strikes. I think the nurses, the ambulance diet drivers do a great job. But this is not the time right now to go on strike, given the system is in such a problem right now. And we need to have more resources and more staffing in those urgent care settings to fix some of these issues. Because it's important. If your child's unwell and you've got a group A strep, you need to be seen within an hour, not within a day, a couple of days. And that's where it goes wrong. And I, I want, I'm, I'm glad you raised that point there because we were talking about strike action before and this is where you will lose the public if you're on strike at such a vital time. And I think this task force you're talking about is important. One other thing which I read, it said lockdowns, masks, vent uh, ventilation, hand washing um, before drugs are available and immunity is, uh, would be broadly similar for future pandemics. It seems to me this report and what these um, advisors are saying is that we'd go back into lockdown if it happened again. Surely not. Yeah, I think this is, I mean, look, the first thing is to say the way this report is put together is not a report that would meet the standards for an evidence-based report. It just doesn't meet what we see in NICE or the World Health Organization. It's basically a group of people sat around a table saying, what do we think? They haven't delineated and said, what's the high quality evidence to say what worked? And if you look at it, many of the features when you go through what they're saying, contact tracing, well, actually, if you get to the nuances, didn't work. NPIs, we don't really know what works. We didn't do any research. We're hoping in the future we do the research. But then you go at the end and go, but we should do more of the same. So mm -hmm. actually, this is a huge missed opportunity. And the question to me is, why at the heart of government and these advisors did they not do the research to assess these NPIs at the time when they could have done? And why now are they coming back and going, let's do more of the same? It's a very odd position. Professor Carl Hennigan, we're going to have to end right there. I know some people are concerned that we've got uh, Witty and Valance marking their own homework too. So thank you very much indeed for joining us, Professor Carl Hennigan. Now we're now joined in the studio by Andrew Eborn to discuss a bizarre story this week to do with e-scooters. Absolutely. Potholes, planning and parking, those are the bane of most people's lives.
couple that with e-scooters, and this is what this case is about. Giovanni uh, Drago, uh, as in the Rocky 24007 uh, movie, she's basically suing Barnet Council because she went over a pothole and basically broke her knee, and she was riding an e-scooter. Now, e-scooters, if they're privately owned, are illegal to use on public roads. Uh, you have to have one from a relevant hire company. So she's basically injured herself and worked on that sort of basis. So she's now suing Barnet Council for £30,000. Barnet Council was saying, well, hang about, we look after the roads, uh, it, it, it was OK. And also, secondly, it was an illegal act and therefore we're not going to cover you. I mean, uh, this it seems bizarre. It's like, it's like a burglar breaking into somebody's house uh, and then injuring themselves on the, you know, slipping on the floor and injuring themselves and, and, and suing the homeowner, isn't it, really? Well, it's, and it's great that you picked that up, Phil, because, as Esther will know from the legal days, the Occupiers Liability Act imposes certain obligations on people who own property, even if people are there illegally. So the short... There's two things to work out. is Has the council complied with their obligations uh, because they have obligations to maintain the roads and make sure they're safe? And secondly, is there... Is there an excuse? Is there a defence to uh, the relevant allegation because it's illegal? Now, the general principle on the, on the first thing, that's a question of fact about whether they've been maintaining the potholes. In terms of the illegality, does it diminish? Well, it could possibly diminish, but not necessarily absolve them completely about that sort of side. If, you, if you're untaxed in your car, for example, and you suffer an injury, uh, you could still have the same issue. I have to say, I think you've got some bare-faced cheek to be doing something illegally and then <laughs> suing somebody, whether it's a burglar in a house or this lady from the local council. You were doing it illegally. I mean, you normally I'd be sympathetic to suing the council because of potholes. <laughs> I'd normally be sympathetic to that as a principle, but not when you're doing something illegal. Unbelievable. I, yeah, I, I, Andrew, I know uh, you're here. You tell us all the, 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 the top legal stories of the week. Thank you very much. I know it's been slightly truncated, what we've done there, because we've had such a busy first a hour. A crazy on potholes. A crazy on potholes. <laughs> lawyers will, the lawyers will benefit. <laughs> they'll, win. they'll still win. Won't He'll sue us probably doing yeah, a exactly. shorter length of time. <laughs> and that's it for the first hour here, but don't go anywhere because after the break we're talking royal rivalries, you know what I'm talking about there, free speech and a cashless society, so don't go anywhere. Every morning from 6 o'clock, we'll wake you up with GB News Breakfast with all the stories you didn't know from the night before. So whether it's serious news, entertainment, or your own views from all over our great nation, we're here to kick off your day with a smile. And the national media should be reflecting and reporting what's happening here. You will notice the northwestern accents. <laughs> whether you're with us on TV, radio, or online, every morning, it's breakfast from 6 a.m. Hope you can join us. We are GB News, right across the nation. You can get us on television, on radio, on digital. We're absolutely everywhere. Amazing! You see, amazing! You remind me of me and the European Parliament. <laughs> but here's the most important bit. We are not part of the mainstream establishment. We think and speak just like you do. We are the people's channel. Magnificent. That's really, really thoughtful. Come and join us on GB News, the people's news channel. My name's Tom Harwood and join me 9.30am every weekday for The Briefing, your one-stop shop for everything you need to know about what's going on in politics today. I wonder if this is a deal that might need to be like the biscuits in this factory, twice baked. Is there not an opportunity here to win out against the extremes? Tom Harwood, GB News. What are you going to do about it? Things should have been done differently and they, and they certainly are being done differently. Don't miss it. The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood, 9.30 Monday to Friday on GB News. Join me, Nana Akwe, Saturday and Sunday afternoons on GB News. Expect fiery debate and passionate discussion as me and my panel tackle some of the biggest topics hitting the headlines. It's a place for everyone's opinion. No one gets cancelled, but no one gets an easy ride. <laughs> oh, she's on it today! I, 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 I... Be ready for conversations that are fierce, frank and, of course, fun every Saturday and Sunday afternoon from 4pm on GB News, the People's Channel. Good morning, welcome back to the show. Coming up this hour, we're going to be talking about access to cash. Labour MP Siobhan McDonnell will be telling us about an amendment she's put down to a bill this week to try and make sure 
that you can have free access to cash from cash point machines. And we'll be talking about royal rivalry. What is going on there between what I'd call the royals and the Kardashian royals? We'll be finding out more with Angela Levin. And we're going to be speaking to Toby Young. The online safety bill comes back to Parliament next week. Has he won his battle for free speech online? We'll be finding out exactly what he thinks. And lots of you have been getting in touch already, but keep those views coming in. Email us at gbviews at gbnews.uk or tweet us at gbnews. But before that, here's the newsletter headlines with Bethany. Esther and Philip, thank you. Good morning. It's two minutes past 11. I'm Bethany Elsie bringing you up to date from the GB newsroom. Parents are being urged to be vigilant and look out for symptoms of strep A after six children under the age of 10 have died from the infection in the UK. Symptoms are usually mild, but the UK Health Security Agency is now investigating the rise in severe cases. Experts say that a lack of mixing during the COVID-19 pandemic could be behind a drop in immunity. Bacteriologist at the University of Aberdeen, Hugh Pennington, says spotting it early is key. Because the disease, this severe manifestation of the disease, is so relatively rare, many doctors won't have seen a case and they may not have that um, high index of suspicion. The good news is that uh, treatment is straightforward with uh, penicillin. Uh, this is not a bug that's developed antibiotic resistance like so many other bacteria. It's still sensitive to penicillin. The, the whole issue really is can you get the penicillin in there quickly enough? Well, NHS GP Dr Veena Babu told GB News the symptoms parents should look out for. Strep A presents the most commonly in three ways. You can get a sore throat, you can get scarlet fever, or you could get a condition called impetigo. So scarlet fever presents as muscle aches, fever. You may get a rash on the skin, which feels what we call your typical sandpaper rash. So they, you might get some bumps coming up on the skin, and that could be on the arms, on the chest, or on the tummy. I would advise parents what we were saying, look, feel, and how the, your kids are feeding. In other news, there's more rail strikes to come this month as thousands of TSSA members are to walk out on the 17th of December in a dispute over jobs, pay and conditions. Services from six further train operators are expected to be affected on top of the two previously announced. The union's organising director, Luke Chester, says his members are fed up of being treated with contempt by employers and government. While the Department for Transport has urged unions and rail operators to work together Together to find a resolution. And in the NHS, neonatal and critical care units are among the services that will be protected from strikes in the build up to Christmas. The Royal College of Nursing says chemotherapy, dialysis, and paediatric intensive care will also not be impacted during planned industrial action on the 15th and 20th of December. Other services will be severely reduced. The G7 and Australia have agreed to restrict the amount Russia can be paid for crude oil. The countries, which include Britain and the US, say the price cap of $60 a barrel will prevent Moscow from profiting from the energy crisis. On Friday, Russia, Russian crude oil was trading at around $67 a barrel, but a senior aide to Ukraine's president says the price should be capped at $30 to hit Russia's economy harder. Matt Hancock has revealed he was warned that COVID-19 could kill hundreds of thousands of people in the UK two months before the country was placed under lockdown. In his new book, the former health secretary said the chief medical officer for England, Professor Chris Whitty, told him in January 2020 that in a worst case scenario, 820,000 could die. The independent MP for West Suffolk made his first appearance in the House of Commons yesterday after taking part in ITV's I'm a Celebrity, Get Me Out of Here in Australia. A company that makes plastic alternative packaging from seaweed has become the first UK winner of Prince William's Earthshot Prize. Notpla is one of five entrepreneurs who've been awarded a million pounds to scale up their green innovation projects. The Prince of Wales says that Earthshot solutions prove we can overcome climate change and change our future. 
And in the last half an hour, the Immigration Minister has defended the government's handling of migrants crossing the Channel after more than 44,000 have reached British shores this year. Speaking to GB News, Robert Jenrick acknowledged stopping the crossings was a priority for the government and that it could cost the Conservatives at the next election if numbers weren't reduced. Mr Jenrick said greater col collaboration with the French was needed. We've tried to negotiate with the French and the Home Secretary signed... Uh, a deal just a few weeks ago, which is an improvement on the situation, but it isn't the answer. It's certainly not a silver bullet. It does mean that there'll be more French officers on the beaches intercepting boats, but arrests are low and it doesn't seem to break the people smugglers' business. So we're clearly going to have to go much further than that. Some of that will be diplomatic, and Rishi Sunak seems to have built a good rapport with President Macron. But a lot of it's going to be harder edged than that. It's going to be using well, our National Crime yeah. Agency, Police, Security Services, GCHQ to go upstream. This is GB News. We'll bring you more news as it happens now. Let's get back to Esther and Philip. Thanks, Bethany. And as I said, lots of you have been getting in touch, particularly about the Immigration mm. Minister's interview. Yes, Gillian says, why is Robert Jenrick so proud of handing out visas like sweets? Doesn't he understand the UK population have had enough of people coming here? We want a break, for heaven's sake. Wake up. Claudette, no confidence in him at all. His job appears to be stop Suella doing the job the voters wanted her to do. Anthony says, how is this overseas student scam allowed to happen? Why are their dependents allowed here at all? This is utter nonsense. Bev, so why are the French bringing the boats to the UK waters? Alan thinks it's time to tear up the international treaties to solve the illegal migration crisis. Ian says, you've got an 80-seat majority, start using it. And Stephen says, more talk from your immigration minister. There is no spine in this government... The public don't want to hear about legislation and diplomatic talking. They want action now. Tories are toast at the next election. Strong views. Mm. And that's why we love you. Exactly. <laughs> now, to talk through the papers, we are again joined by political commentator Claire Purcell and the local government editor of Conservative Home, Harry Thibbs. So we shall, we'll start with you this time, Harry. Dive into those stories you've been looking at. Well, the Daily Telegraph has got... Uh, story saying, calling judges so or madam banned from courts, saying that um, from now on, judges will no longer be called so or madam in an attempt to keep up with modern terminology and to be gender neutral, to avoid misgendering, by which I, for which I presume is meant accurate biological mm. gendering. And I think... Can it's... you miss or Mr Gen <laughs> gender <laughs> miss now? You, Mr. you gender. have to be careful um, with that, won't you? Um, the, uh, <laughs> I mean, I think it's... I think it's uh, a mistake. I mean, I'd like, I'm a traditionalist anyway, but I think in terms of in terms of courts, you don't want the judge to be your your mate. I mean, you want you so want to have a certain called? professional authority, and to, and maintaining some of these um, traditions, I think, helps uh, helps maintain proper authority. They also say, what are you going to do about the lay? And so, what are, what are they going to be called? So, so, you, so you say judge instead of saying sir Ask. or madam, you say judge. Just but then, judge, lay, just lay judge. magistrates, they're not judges, so presumably they might still continue to be called sir, or maybe that lay magistrates have some <laughs> special invention. But it, 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 it seems to be modernisation um, for its own sake, you know, rather than doing anything that will mm. um, help enhance the. The, the court. So I think it's a, it's it's a, it's a uh, pity. I think more public confidence in the courts would happen if they started giving out some stiffer sentences to criminals. That'd be what I would think. That would probably help more, too. That would that'd yes, that'd that, be that, that, possibly be yeah. even more important than calling. These concern. sort of changes yeah. are a bit like chairs on the Titanic, aren't they? You want much, so I just say, greater power. It's a solution it's not... looking for a problem, isn't yeah. it? Really, to be perfectly honest. Claire, what have you got? Ah. Uh, Good old uh, Daily Star, which has uh, made a really good headline for the uh, for chipolatas. <laughs> so we've got big problems with our chipolatas, they state, and it's the cost of living crisis hitting our Christmas lunch. 
And what it says here is the Chipolatas use in pigs in blankets are going up by a whopping 42.7%. Now, anybody that's done the shopping recently will understand how much the prices have gone up in supermarkets. It is really expensive. Mm. It's becoming even more so. And so this is looking at what your cost of your Christmas lunch is going to be. And it is a time of joy and wonder. It should be a time of joy and wonder. Everybody's sitting around eating together. But unfortunately, I think some families are really going to struggle. They've picked on pigs in blankets, but it's also things like roast potatoes costing 33% more. There are a problem with supply of turkeys um, due to avian flu, and they're going to be up by about 21% if you can get hold of one. And that's where I saw stories where people are saying, look, this is the cost of it, let's share it all out so everybody yeah. bring a tenner to a dinner. And I did smile because as a student and various other things, yes. we do that at Christmas. You do the starter, you do the veg, Absolutely. you do whatever and share the cost. So if people are doing that this Christmas, good for you. So is that the bit that's gone up the most then, the chip, the, the pigs it, in blankets? It is, is the is pigs that, in blankets. The, the... Yeah, you love them as well. You, you, you... He's already placed yeah. his order well, for this, them. Well, this is it. You'll be lucky to, to get them well, by the looks of it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But I'm... I do love the idea of sharing and everybody bringing a course. And surely that's what Christmas is about. It isn't the consumerism, it's actually spending time with people and sharing that. So I'm, I'm all in favour for it. The only um, spending there is time. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> now, the story that caught my eye today was in the Daily Express, page 17, and it says, London 2012 has failed to inspire us to be more active. Uh, the sports legacy of the 2012 London Olympic Games has been a failure, according to Lord Moynihan, a former chairman of the British Olympic Association, who won a silver medal at the 1980 Moscow Games himself. And it caught my eye because I was on the DCMS Select Committee between the years of 2006 and 2015. And when I first got on the committee, one of our jobs was to, was to scrutinise the preparation for the Olympic Games. And one, of course, one of the things that we were told for the London Olympics was that we were going to have this great legacy of everyone was going to take up sport and all the rest of it. And on the committee, we were hugely sceptical about this because we'd looked at every single previous Olympic Games that had gone before and not one... Not one had led to an increase in in physical activity and sporting <laughs> activity and whatever. It was a bit like uh, happens at Wimbledon every year, you know, yeah. for, for sort of two or three weeks at Wimbledon, the tennis courts are full around the country. And then as <laughs> soon it. as it goes, they all empty again. And we said, look, this is the, why it's never happened anywhere else. Why on earth would it happen? Oh, it's going to be different this time. And so it was. It just made me smile. Uh, page 17 of the Express to show that the DCMS Select Committee, we were vindicated well, in our well scepticism. <laughs> well, a decade you were, later. That you were yeah. ever going to see any kind of uplift in, uh, in physical activity. Well, look, you were going to have it here. And I think just to remind people all the time to be fit and healthy and go and do something and be inspired by somebody, you know, we, we, you had to do it, didn't you? No, but I mean, the thing is to say, look, if you want to hold the Olympic Games, that's fine. And they were a massive success for the country, they really, were. in many regards. And, yes, they were. And all the rest of people. But I think the, my point point would be, let's be honest about why we have the Olympic Games. Let's not just make up stuff, which actually at the heart of it we know was... You just feel vindicated. That's, feel that's all it is. It doesn't happen very often. It doesn't Harry, very moving often. Harry, moving to you. Um, yes, there was a piece in the Times saying to Conservative MPs, be more like Theresa May. And, uh, <laughs> Did you read it closely, stop being, though? And stop being so lazy, you Tory MPs. If you want to get re-elected, you need to knock on more doors and put out more leaflets. And, and one of your colleagues is suggesting that, that there's a bit more to it than the message, that uh, the, 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 um, the, the knocking on doors is the actual message itself you've got because of the small boats that uh, Brexit uh, voters feel betrayed. And you were quite rightly challenging the immigration minister robert jenrick um, about about this over uh, over the details and i'm sure he's you know he's 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 very good uh, about about getting to stuck in on some of the technical points but I think that for the Brexit voters, saying to them, oh, well, you misunderstand, it's the European um, Court of Human Rights that's bossing us around, it's not the European Court of Justice, so it's nothing to do with the European Union. But the, 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 I mean, the punters say, look, we want to have an independent country making our own laws, um, that's why we voted Brexit, you're the government, sort it out, you know, we, 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 whatever it's, you know, repeal the Human Rights Act or, or leave the European Convention on Human Rights or whatever, do whatever you need to do, but um, we're, we're absolutely fed up. And I think however many doors you knock on, they're probably... He's still going to be fed up unless it unless the issue is well, sorted out. It did make me smile that headline though, isn't it? Be more like Theresa May, Tories. So I've never I've never heard that advice before. I've, I've got, must say, in all the years, I've never heard that advice before. It's quite a niche piece of advice. I mean, I think <laughs> it, it it's a nice idea that all you need to do is go and knock on a few more doors. I mean, yes, that's important, but I think Harry's quite right. It is the message you put out there. Um, but I'm not sure that uh, putting anybody up as the the poster girl is 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 a good idea. I think strong and stable. 
strong and stable, <laughs> Glenn, remember that. that. <laughs> thank you both very much indeed, Harry. I hope to have you back on soon. That was great. Thank you. Now, an amendment to the Financial Services and Markets Bill, which was put forward by Labour MP Siobhan McDonough, seeks to insert the word free into the bill, ensuring that the government would make a provision to guarantee a minimum level of access to free of charge cash access services for consumers across the UK. It comes after research showed that 5.4 million people living in the UK rely on cash to a greater or very great extent in their day-to-day -day lives. Well, to discuss this amendment further, we're delighted to be joined now by Siobhan. Hello, how are you this morning? Hi, Good to see you. Hello. So, how are you going to sort of get this amendment through? Have you got support from the government? Is it going to happen? Well, at this stage, the honest answer is I don't know. Uh, I know that Philip signed it, so maybe, Esther, you might agree to put your name to it as well. Um, we've So far, we've got um, 16 Conservative MPs who've uh, agreed to support the amendment. We have uh, representatives from every party right across the House. And what you'll both know is that access to cash is really important to a significant proportion of our constituents in all types of constituencies. Um, we're seeing with the cost of living crisis, we're seeing even greater reliance on cash, for particularly for people who are hard pressed. So um, it's really important that with all the bank branch closures, people can get their money out free of charge. Siobhan, as you indicated, I, I very much agree with you about this and I've, I've signed your amendment, so thank you for, thank you for what you're doing. I, I was just wanted to pick up on your last point because I think it was a really important one, that in times of, uh, of tough economic times, lots of people on low incomes, they do find it easier, don't they, to budget using cash rather than yeah. uh, cards. And do you think that uh, enough politicians and maybe the banking industry, do, do you think they really appreciate that? To be fair, I think politicians of all parties do because they're the people who talk to their constituents and talk to more people from more different sorts of backgrounds. What we know uh, is that in August, um, the post office gave out more cash than ever before mm. since records began. And that's because I think many households are going back to the way our mums manage their money, you know, where you'd have a tin for the gas bill, a tin for the electricity bill, a tin for the rent. So you could put in so much every week and you knew you weren't going to get the bill that was going to frighten you. And Siobhan, do you think um, people are looking at distorted figures like the COVID figures when they thought, oh, fewer people were using cash. Well, we were told not to use cash and use a card mm. instead. So they're looking at those figures and saying, oh, we don't need cash after all. And it's not the case. It was for that period of time when we were told not to use cash. Yeah. I mean, I do accept that certainly it's a generational thing and you'll find that many young people uh, never have cash on them, don't use <laughs> cash. But there are, that doesn't mean that there aren't significant uh, groups of people who do use cash and who are turning to cash when money is tight. Yeah, Siobhan, thank you very much indeed for joining us. We really, we really appreciate your time and I appreciate what you're doing. And from what I've heard, I think the good news, Siobhan, is from what I've heard, it sounds to me, from what Esther's just been saying, that she's, it sounds to me as if she might sign your amendment. Do you not think that she, sound, she sounded... <laughs> She well, sounded quite you. sympathetic to what you were doing. Do you know what, Siobhan, it's like a pincer effect. I've got you now from both sides. I'll, 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 I'll have a, she doesn't usually take much notice of what I say, Siobhan, but I will have a word with her later, and I'm sure that we can, I can persuade her to sign and remember. But I, I'm really Thank pleased you, that you came Thank on and spoke much. about it, because this is a really important issue for lots yeah, of people. And, uh, and I wish you well with your amendment. And I hope the government listened to you, Siobhan. So thank you for coming on Thank and speaking you. to us about it today. Thank, Thank you. you. Now, coming up, it is time for a royal roundup and what it's a week it's been for the royal family, so don't go anywhere. Awful. It's been an awful week.
Monday to Thursday, 9 p.m. till 11 p.m. Join me, Dan Wooten. I'll bring you the sharpest takes and hottest debates. Do you okay. believe in prisons? I, I don't believe in prisons. I'm completely right. stunned. I guarantee you there'll be no spin, no bias, no censorship. I actually was personally quite offended by it. <laughs> and no reason to go to bed. So I guess they've always been quite woke. That's Dan Wooten tonight on TV, radio and online. Monday to Thursday from 9 p.m. till 11 p.m. on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Every morning from 6 o'clock, we'll wake you up with GB News Breakfast with all the stories you didn't know from the night before. So whether it's serious news, entertainment or your own views from all over our great nation, we're here to kick off your day with a smile. And the national media should be reflecting and reporting what's happening here. You will notice the northwestern accents. <laughs> Whether you're with us on TV, radio or online, every morning, it's breakfast from 6am. Hope you can join us. Join me every Sunday at 6pm for Gloria Meets. In exclusive interviews, I'll be finding out who our politicians really are and what they really think. It's something that you would never want anyone to suffer. I didn't know what channels there were. B, I didn't think I'd be believed. I must have weighed about seven stone and I'm five foot eight. My instincts was to sort of cover this up. I mean, clearly that was a mistake. Join me every Sunday at 6pm on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Hello there, it's Eamon Holmes here from Breakfast on GB News. We're not just on your television and your screens, you know. We're on DAB Plus Digital Radio, so you can listen to your favourite shows on the move. If you've not yet listened to GB News Radio, it's very simple. We're on your radio player and tune in apps. On your smart speaker, phone or tablet, or online at gbnews.uk. Take us with you wherever you go. GB News Radio. You never have to miss a moment of the People's Channel. My name's Tom Harwood and join me 9.30am every weekday for The Briefing, your one-stop shop for everything you need to know about what's going on in politics today. I wonder if this is a deal that might need to be like the biscuits in this factory, twice baked. Is there not an opportunity here to win out against the extremes? Tom Harwood, GB News. What are you going to do about it? Things should have been done differently and they, and they certainly are being done differently. Don't miss it. The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood, 9.30, Monday to Friday on GB News. Hello, I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11pm, where I'll be joined by two of the country's top comedians as we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers tonight. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it, I guarantee, but we'll also have some fun along the way. That's GB News Headliners at 11pm. We won't put you to sleep, unlike some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us, 11pm, seven nights a week. Welcome back. It's 11.23. Now, it's been a difficult week for the royal family, has it not? As they've been rocked by twin scandals of racism accusations and the release of the Netflix trailer of Harry and Meghan's Insider documentary. Prince William and Princess Catherine are currently finishing their trip in the United States, where the Prince of Wales met US President Joe Biden on their final day. Let's now welcome to the studio royal commentator and biographer Angela Levin. So, it was a big week. Some people say this is probably the worst week for the royal family, at least the new generation of royal yeah. family. Very difficult for them from all sources, actually, I think. Um, the accusations that they are racist is horrendous, really. And then the um, quite obvious um, got to beat, each one's got to beat the other one. And I think that it looks um, really upsetting that it should come to this. I'm sure that um, Harry and Meghan are very jealous, particularly of Catherine, um, because, you know, she looks stunning in anything she wears. If you saw her last night mm. in this green dress, and going along with the feeling that it's um, looking after the planet, she rented it. It cost £72 pounds to rent for the evening and you think you know yeah, she looks stunning in it and you think well done whereas Merrigan doesn't quite get it right it doesn't matter to me it doesn't matter dresses is not the important part of it but I think Megan's always got to win whatever she's doing 
she's got to win. It does seem unseemly, doesn't it? And they would have known surely about this visit by Kate and Wilms years ago because they would have planned it a long time ago. And then it's like they've gate crashed what they were doing to launch themselves on top. So it's vicious rivalry. Some might say jealousy. Well, I said jealousy, very jealous, but it's also vicious, as you say. And I think if you see the actual um, bit which shows you what's going to happen, I, I felt quite sick, actually. Oh, this trailer. The trailer. Yeah, the trailer. I, mean, I don't want to go into her privacy, not in the least, but you see all these kisses and lots of attention and you think, well, actually... Um, this is completely inappropriate to do that. We're looking at some of these pictures now, and I have to say, it seems to me as if they've all been staged and all been done. Yes. And there's one in particular, and I thought it was really rather strange, and this is where Meghan looks like she could be crying, and Harry's sitting back and it's like, you don't understand what we're going through. I just wondered, how did you get that photo as if that were at the time? where she's in tears with how difficult it was at the royal family and Harry's pulling his hair out. How do you get that photo? Well, you ask a photographer to come along and then you act it. She's an actress. She's been trying to get Harry to be a bit of an actor, but not very successfully. He can't do it. Quite right, too. And So is this just was... auditioning for uh, a film? <laughs> auditioning to do lots of documentaries and look really hurt and fed up. But that one is quite obviously staged and phony. And I think that that's um, a appalling thing to do, actually. Do you, think that, do you think that Harry and Meghan's antics are affecting William and Catherine's uh, image and, and reputation and reception in the US? I, I, I only ask because I've been reading the papers about the, that we saw cheering crowds in Boston and a walkabout, but also there were reports of boos to them at a basketball game. And I just wondered whether or not Harry and Meghan, it's like sort of mutual suicide, that in effect they're trashing... They're, they're, what, mm -hmm. trying, to buy, trying to compete with each other they're to make the each brand. other look good, they're committing mutual suicide and making each other look bad. I think it depends what side of the river you're on. If you think that Meghan has had a very bad time, I mean, I would just say that without the royal family, she wouldn't be known at all, so there's no gratitude there. But you, you either think, oh, yes, they're a wonderful couple and they're woke and they're modern and the rest of them are all old-fashioned. And then you see um, Catherine and William, their feeling is to dedicate themselves to helping others. They do things, they're loyal, they're hard-working. Meghan and Harry are all about me, me, me. So it depends who you are and what you like. But I do think, having read the papers um, this morning, uh, that actually the, they were tremendously successful last night and several reporters in America were this saying... This is at the Earth Shot Awards. The Earth Shot. And several reporters were saying, you know, only royals like them could have done this. They've got musicians in, they've got actors in, they've got famous people. They've got them all together, all willing to come along, even an ex-footballer. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, yes, that uh, photo of Bex yes. and Catherine kissing. Yes. Well, not um, quite kissing, a kiss on the cheek, sorry, yeah. I'm starting rumours here. <laughs> yeah, and uh, they thought that they'd done extremely well. Also, the pre United States President Biden going along to meet William. He was, happened to be there at the same time, but William couldn't go to him because he had an engagement already. So he came all the way to see him, which I think is very significant. He's never met Harry and Meghan. So it depends what you think is important. Because mm, some I... people might think, you know, the, the, the Sussexes are winning it in the States. Yes. And are they saying, look, uh, and, and this is where the battle of the royals are, we will dominate America, you're not coming on our turf, and you stick to old blighty. Is this the message that Meghan and Harry are sending out? Well, I think it's a message that will uh, continue everywhere, not just old blighty. They want old blighty too. That's why they want to hang on to their titles. But I think that um, well, they are going about, down... Should he give up his titles now? Should Harry well, give up his Harry titles? Harry should give up his titles because his father can't. I mean, people keep saying, take away the titles. You can't take away the fact that he is a prince. He was a prince from birth. And if you do that, Meghan will be called Prince Henry or Prince Harry. 
which she would not use. She'll use, obviously, uh, wants to be her. Printers. So it's a very difficult situation to work at, even if you want to. It, it sounds actually m more glorious if you're a princess than if you're a duchess, doesn't it? Just one final question, Angela, if I might. We've had the scandal of sort of Lady Susan Hussey and her remarks at that Buckingham Palace reception, uh, and obviously lots of people have expressed opinions about it. I've heard it suggested uh, that if the Queen had still been alive, she wouldn't have seen her lose her role. Uh, do you think there's any any? Tr I mean, it's, obviously, it's impossible to know. But do you think there's any? Do you, what, what's well, your suspicion? Well, she wouldn't have been there, that? would she? Actually, she would be looking after the Queen. She was looking after her and aid to her for sixty-two years. So she wouldn't have come to that. But in that situation, do you think the Queen would have protected her better than the, the rest I, I, of the royals? You know, do you think? The Queen had a wonderful way of dealing with things with a line, didn't she? She would get it, everything right in a few words. I don't know what Yes, it's not that my recollections, mm. you know, where she'd say, well, people see things differently, not my recollections. You're right. And maybe this is a lack of experience showing here in the royal Well, uh, one person, you know, several people have said that she's quite deaf. So mm. she might have asked several times because she couldn't Could. have heard, mm. heard. But how could you get all that written down? Was there a mic? Did you take something to record it? Mm. Yeah. We don't know. These are very difficult questions mm. and it's a, a tragedy because trying to end um, domestic violence is very high on the Queen's list and all that's disintegrated and instead it's all about racism and an 83-year-old, whether or not she has um, shown how the royal family are, really. Um, and I think that's a real shame because there's so many women who need help domestically that it's, that it's gone down the tube like that. Angela, thank you so much as ever. It's always a pleasure to, to have you with us, so thank, thank you very much indeed. Coming up, we'll be joined in the studio by the director of the Free Speech Union, Toby Young. But first, it's time for the headlines with Bethany. Esther and Philip, thank you. Good morning. It's 11.32. I'm Bethany Elsie in the GB newsroom. Parents are being urged to be vigilant and look out for symptoms of strep A after six children under the age of 10 have died from the infection in the UK. Symptoms are usually mild, but the UK Health Security Agency is now investigating the rise in severe cases. Experts say that a lack of mixing during the COVID-19 pandemic could be behind a drop in immunity. The G7 and Australia have agreed to restrict the amount Russia can be paid for crude oil. The countries say the price cap of $60 a barrel will prevent Moscow from profiting from the energy crisis. On Friday, Russian crude oil was trading at around $67 a barrel. The senior aide to Ukraine's president says the price should be capped at $30 to hit Russia's economy harder. Thousands of TSSA members are to walk out on the 17th of December in a dispute over jobs, pay and conditions. Services from six further train operators are expected to be affected on top of the two previously announced. The union says its members feel they're being treated with contempt by employers and the government. The Department for Transport has urged unions and rail operators to work together to find a resolution. And today marks 30 years since the first ever text message was sent. One in three people still send and receive SMS messages every day. And 20% still use SMS as their default messaging platform. The first text was sent by engineer Neil Papworth in December 1992. It read, Merry Christmas. Well, it's a bit too soon for that just yet. You're up to date on TV, online and DAB Plus Radio. This is GB News. Now let's get back to Esther and Philip. Now, the online safety bill is again returning to Parliament under the uh, fourth Prime Minister and seventh Secretary of State since it was first proposed as an online harms white paper under Theresa May. While advocates argue that the bill is necessary to help protect the vulnerable online, the free speech implications of a regulation of this scale are enormous. Here to discuss things further is Toby Young. Delighted to have you back here. So do you think, as the bill has changed now, and you're always concerned about uh, legal uh, but harmful, is the job a good one now? Is it done? Have you won? Is free speech protected online? 
I think the new version of the bill, we haven't actually seen it yet, I don't think it's going to be published until next week, but we gather <clears throat> that the new version of the bill is is a big improvement on the previous version. So they've improved it in various ways. One of the things the Free Speech Union was concerned about was a new communications offence that was going to be included in the bill, the harmful communications offence, whereby if you said something that caused someone else psychological harm, defined as causing them extreme distress, you could be jailed for up to two years. And we were concerned that that could easily be weaponised by woke activists to try and jail their political opponents, claiming that merely hearing hurty <laughs> words caused them extreme distress. That's gone, so that's, that's a big improvement. Um, one of the provisions of the bill required social media platforms like YouTube, Twitter, Facebook um, to um, have regard for free speech when thinking about whether to remove content you know, as a parliamentarian, that have regard is the least onerous of the legal duties, virtually meaningless. I think that's going to be beefed up to have particular regard, so that's a slight <laughs> improvement. Uh, but finally, the... the Take your victories wherever <laughs> you get them. I, I, I don't look a gift horse in the mouth. Um, uh, uh, but um, uh, yeah, the big difference is that Clause 13, um, which set out... Um, provision for a statutory instrument to be brought forward setting out what content was legal but harmful to adults, that clause is gone. Um, one concern is that some of that legal but harmful material that was going to be in the supplementary legislation is now going to appear on the face of the bill. Um, so, um, but, but one big difference is previously uh, social media platforms were required to say how they intended to address this legal but harmful content that the government was going to define, that's gone. Now they just have to say, we're going to, how, how, they're just going to say how, they, how, they, how they're going to make provision for those who don't want to see it. What tools are they going to give them so they can set their safety settings so they don't see this supposedly <laughs> legal but harmful to adult content? Oh, well, I, I think it steps in the right direction. It, it's definitely a step in the right direction. It's an improvement on what it was. I think there's still room for more improvement and I'll be hoping to contact you as MPs to, to tell you how I think we can make it even better. Well, what, what one of the things that some people are now moving on to, now the legal but harmful stuff has sort of been uh, dealt with to a certain extent, is this requirement for private messaging services to, to intercept and scan people's messages uh, before they're uploaded. Is, is that something that you have a big concern about too? Yeah, I am concerned about that. I mean, we're not exactly clear how that'll work. How, that um, was my first question. How does yeah. that work? Yeah. I know you said it very eloquently there, yeah. Phil, but I'm thinking, how does that work? Well, I mean, well, I don't know technically how it works, <laughs> but I understand the principle behind it, that yes. in effect, people, these companies will be will be looking and monitoring yes. Yes. people's private messages. Well, that's worse. That's... Yes. I mean, I think, well, I think the, 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 the concern is that... Um, you know, WhatsApp, for instance, messages between two private individuals just speaking to each other on WhatsApp will be monitored to see if they're saying anything unlawful. And that feels a bit big brotherish, as though, well, yeah. you know, can't you be a little bit outrageous and controversial, even sailing quite close to the wind in a purely private exchange? It's what's next? Are they going to monitor people's conversations in pubs to make sure they're not saying yeah. anything, you know, unlawful? It seems a little bit... Two a little words bit spring like to a, mind there, big brother. Big brother, I yeah. So I don't like that. And uh, one final question we wanted to ask you about was where we thought we were going to get stronger freedom of speech in universities yes. so that people in an education surroundings could debate things. That They seem to be going backwards on that now. Less free speech? Yes, there was an alarming development this week with the Higher Education Freedom of Speech Bill, which is really the most pro-free speech thing, you know, the Conservative government has done over the past uh, 12 years. <laughs> um, uh, and um, it is going to make free speech protections in universities, at least in England, slightly more robust. But the great thing about this bill is that it was going to create, or well, it is going to create, various enforcement mechanisms. So a new free speech champion in the Office for Student, the students, the university's regulator in England, as well as, and this was the critical thing the bill was going to do, give students and academics who feel as though their, their speech rights have been, been breached, if they're no platform, for instance, the opportunity to sue their universities for not discharging their legal duties with respect to upholding free speech. That's what's being diluted. And it's been suggested by the government that that be diluted and that students and academics uh, only have an opportunity to sue universities for breaching their speech rights as a last resort. 
when they've exhausted every other complaints procedure. That, we think, is a sort of gold embossed invitation to kick these complaints into the long grass, whereas sometimes you need to act quickly. If someone's been no-platformed, you want to get them restored immediately. And to do that, you have to be able to go to court and not only go to court as a last resort. We're hoping the government will, will see sense on that and we're lobbying them to try and persuade them to, to bring that talk back, because that's a really important enforcement mechanism if we want free speech to be upheld in universities. Well, we will keep an eye on these developments, and I'm sure you'll be keeping an eye on these developments, Toby. Thank you so much for giving us that insight and update. And the bill is back in Parliament, the online safety bill, uh, next week. But coming up, we'll be talking about Kanye West, who has again made headlines with controversial comments. So don't go anywhere. Monday to Thursday nights on GB News. At 6, it's Deebs & Co. 7 o'clock, Farage. At 8, join Mark Stein. And at 9, Dan Wooten tonight, followed by headliners. On TV, radio and online, this is GB News. We are GB News, the people's channel. Why not take us home with you by visiting the GB News shop at gbnews.store. You'll find all the official merchandise, a really good present actually for yourself, for your friends or your family. We ship across the UK mainland at no extra cost. GB News, the people's channel. Here on GB News Live, we'll be keeping you in the picture, finding out what's happening across the country and finding out why it matters to you. We'll have the facts fast with our team of reporters and specialist correspondents. Wherever it's happening, we'll be there. From 12 noon on TV, radio and online. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Monday to Thursday on GB News, it's Bev Turner today from 10 a.m. We're going to be here for you, our GB News family, to keep you up to date, but also make you smile. The guy went from puberty to adultery. <laughs> and I can't wait to bring a few of my own opinions. I have no time for cultural totalitarianism. <laughs> we'll engage in passionate, but always polite debate with your thoughts and opinions at the centre of it all. Only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. Welcome back. It's 11.42 and lots of you have been getting in touch about all sorts of different subjects. Yes, I've got Brian from Scotland here. He said, I'm old school. I use cash only. When my cash is done, I'm done until the next payday. I get that. And lots of people commenting about Claire's story about uh, pigs in blankets going up astronomically. Um, Rick says, all this focus on one meal as part of a cost of living crisis is a joke. Try asking the people in Ukraine if they're worried about the price of pigs in blankets. And I've got the, on the strike action, Andy from South Yorkshire. Can I suggest that all unions involved pay back their furlough scheme money that they and the workers receive to protect their jobs and livelihoods during lockdown? They then can be given a better pay rise. Really can't see him or Mick Lynch agreeing to that, can you? And lots of comments have been coming through about the interview with Robert Jenrick about the immigration situation. Ruth says, what planet is Robert Jenrick on? People are absolutely fed up with the migrant situation and tired of all the government excuses. We are the people they need to please. We voted for them to do that. Um, but Alan says, Conservative voters who threaten to abandon the party due to rising immigration are politically ignorant and grossly out of touch with reality. The Labour Party would be far worse. But lo loads and loads of comments about the interview about with Robert Jenry. But it was good that issue. we got him on it was. and we put your questions to it and for also for him to realise the sense of urgency. Exactly. I mean, I think to be, uh, to be fair to Robert Jenry, if I'm allowed to be, is, uh, you know, he's inherited this job. He, he hasn't created yeah. the problem. He's nobody wants, it. Nobody wants but, to know all but people get definitely on want it. some people definitely want some urgent action. I anyway, Kanye remember. West has been suspended from P P Twitter. <laughs> I don't know what I was saying that. <laughs> but he's been suspended from Twitter over offensive tweets with new boss Elon Musk saying the controversial musician had violated the company's rules against incitement to violence. 
In one tweet, Kanye posted a symbol which combined a swastika and a Star of David. He also praised the Nazis and Adolf Hitler whilst appearing in an interview at the end of the week. The US rapper has understandably caused outrage with his recent behaviour, but our next guest has argued it's now time to leave him alone, saying the artist needs help rather than attention. Welcome to the show, Oliver Bateman. So, what, he's having a breakdown? He's had a breakdown, we're all watching it, he's saying the most awful things. Why does he need help rather than attention? Uh, if anything, we are either watching a mental breakdown in very slow motion or a really extensive piece of performance art. But in either case, the best thing that we could possibly do is keep the cameras off him. And I think that both parties in the U.S. are having a very hard time doing that. You know, on the one hand, uh, you know, he's gone on a lot of right wing shows in the U.S. of late. Uh, some that have not even been able to uh, to let him finish, like he went on a recent podcast, uh, the Tim Pool podcast, and walked off while making anti-Semitic remarks. And then, you know, the mainstream and left-wing media is eager to criticize him at every turn and give him even more publicity. So it's it's sort of the worst of both worlds. Whatever he's doing, if he's having a mental breakdown or if he's doing some sort of bizarre performance art or some combination of both, we can't keep the cameras off him, it seems, at a time when he really should just be allowed to disappear. We're, we're giving him as much publicity as he's ever received. Yeah, yeah I mean, obviously, it's, it's uh, shocking, really, that some of the stuff... I mean, I presume, uh, Oliver, that there's no coming back for Kanye West from all of this, is there? I mean, we've seen unu more unusual things in the past. You know, Bob Dylan in the, the 60s and to going into the 70s and going into the 80s had some strange phases. And we've seen other artists sort of redeem themselves later in life. Uh, but it, it certainly looks like the, this train is only going in one direction. You never know. I mean, you never know in terms of a uh, second act to a career. But I, I don't I don't know how you return from this. I mean, he had been restored to Twitter, for example, only to be, under the new regime uh, of Elon Musk, only to be banned again uh, yeah. the other day. Oliver, it's, you know, he was a man in sort of the late 90s, sort of early 2000. He was a rapper. He was a music producer. He won 22 Grammys. He was earning hundreds of millions of pounds. He married Kim Kardashian. All gone wrong. But supposedly this was a bid for the presidential election in 2024. Uh, it, it is certainly a bid for something. Um, it, it could be a bid for attention. Uh, it's been framed as a, a bid for the presidency. And the, the strange part is that he's surrounded himself at this time with some of the more fringe uh, right-wing figures in the United States, uh, figures that almost seemed like they, they had sort of run their course in 2016 or 2017 uh, and whose views were sort of so noxious uh, that that they weren't going to come back into the mainstream. And uh, in the course of making this this bid, whether for the presidency or attention or both, he's, he's pulled in the Nick Fuenteses and the uh, the Milos from, from your country there who uh, are saying all sorts of unspeakable things. They, they have this forum once again through Kanye West's uh, descent into something or other to, uh, to be out there. It's it's very unusual. I, I don't think it's a bid for the presidency, but it's certainly a bid for our eyeballs. Oliver Lee Bateman, thank you very much indeed for taking the time to join us this morning. We appreciate it. It's thank now you, time guys. for our usual end of the show with the sports and showbiz. We've got Aidan McGee and Hayley Palmer. How are you doing? Um, Hayley, what on earth did you make of Kanye West? I mean, that's... Unbelievable stuff, isn't it, really? Yeah, it, it really is. It's quite shocking, isn't it, um, just to see that there. Um, but... even, even Donald Trump's been distancing himself from uh, Kanye West. Yeah, and... yeah, it's, it's, it's quite shocking. But um, I want to talk about Strictly. Did you see it last night? No, I can't say I did. <laughs> I was, you missed out. I was watching the football. Of course you were. Well, I was watching Strictly and it was musical week because of the football it was on Friday and the results are tonight. But I have to say... I just think there should be a Strictly, without any contestant, going to Sylvia Young, already have performed in the musical stage school and having zero dance experience. It's not fair. It's musical week. You know, Kim Marsh, she's already been in the musical. 
And I know that Will, he's got a theatre school. That's not fair. I want to set up my own Strictly. Can't the, can't the viewers take that into account, though? Can't no, because they, they don't well, take it into account. But I used to have my own dance school and I used to teach Borum and Latin. And I used to say to some guys, put your left leg forward. That would sometimes take half an hour to achieve that. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's the right leg. Well, you it's teach the left them. leg. <laughs> I think it'd take even longer than you to be perfectly honest. I've got two left I've got two left legs. <laughs> I don't want to say anything. But it is an unfair advantage. It if is. People have got that basic movement, the basic steps, or what have you. Of course, they're going to be leap years ahead of everybody. Else. Exactly. So enough is enough. I'm not happy about that, but I am looking forward to the Christmas special. But you, see, you should have watched the football. With, I, should, I, I should might turn to the football, football after but all, was Bill. It, what was it also saying? Those who've never danced before really shouldn't be on this show. We need you of a higher calibre. We need people who can actually do it a bit better. Maybe it was saying. Has this not happened before, Haley? No. Yeah, it's happened shows. years and years, but I feel like it's got it's got more like magnified recently. Because yeah. I was looking up who was in the final, I was looking up their experience, and it's just not fair. They're all performers. Oh yeah, I'm an actress. Yeah, but you've got dance experience. Yeah. If you've got dance experience, it's not She's fair. a tough Ran judge. Over. She's a tough <laughs> judge. Has anyone got a soapbox? I think Kaylee's got something she wants to, <laughs> to say. About. But, I know I was watching the mighty Brazil get beaten by Cameroon last night. Yeah. It was a terrific game. It was a great game. Sadly, it didn't yield qualification to the knockout phase for Cameroon, but they get a fantastic account of themselves. Coming mm. out, going to that group and coming out with five points, still not qualifying, that's a little bit disappointing. But we have to consider <laughs> as well, it's a, it's a, it was a slightly second string Brazil side as well. And then all eyes tomorrow, England against uh, Senegal. Too many people looking ahead to the quarterfinals. It's a classic, classic English thing. We're writing <laughs> off this team, and they are the champions of Africa. They've got some outstanding players. I mean, even without Sadio Mane, who played for Liverpool for the last five, six years or so, they've gone out of the group stage. So they've come through the group stage relatively comfortably on six points, and they're going to be a hell of a hell of an opposition for England tomorrow night. So, so it's they're, the, the knockout stage. Going to win. It's the knockout it? stage, isn't knockout it? Knockout stage, yes. So the knockout stage begins tonight. So we're talking uh, so Holland goes USA. To games. If it's a draw, you go then to extra time and then penalties. And then yeah. This England is when lose it gets on serious. Penalty. And then England well, yeah, lose yeah, on penalties. Yeah, yeah. Well, don't Are know, England going to win? Well, I, I, yes, <laughs> I, I think I think they will. There we go. We had a We've got to play. We can't play them with a game of athleticism and trying to strong arm them. We've got to play them at football. And that's what, that, that, what I mean by that is... It's the most film. obvious thing I've ever heard anybody <laughs> ever say in my life. Yeah. We've got to beat them play football. football. Yeah, we have got to play... When I say they've got to keep the ball in the deck, play around them, use the players that we've got. And I think any number of players... Let's think, what are you looking at me for, uh, Phil? Uh, you think, you're looking at me as if it's well, saying, hey, there's talking a, nonsense. You'd probably do a better job than Gavin Southgate. Oh, yeah, possibly. I'm going to say you'd do a better yeah. job on Strictly. So, <laughs> your friend and ours, friend of the show, Chesney Hawks, oh, no. England mascot. Yeah. Honestly, we need Chesney at every single game. That's the law from now on. Because he came on, sang the one and only, and then they went on to score two goals. And it's all thanks to Chesney, in my opinion. Mm. So, Six. we are delighted three. with that. Three, three goals. Three, three, goals. three, three goals. Two straight away. Oh, and then one later, it was three. He's I do not, yeah. not am a sports the, reporter. He's not claiming the third one, just those two goals. <laughs> but he was like, I know he's a West Ham fan, I know he loves his football, and well, good on chess. What I'm thinking, if he made England come back and win, what I'm wondering is, can that make, I don't know, Chesney come back, be number one? In the Definitely. Of yes, Chesney, you've got to do this. I know he watches the show. Um, I know he's at Butlins, I think, this weekend, and he's flying back out. So go on, Ches. <laughs> Number one. We need him and uh, the boxing. Yeah, that's right. Uh, Derek Chisora fighting against Tyson Fury this evening. Not the fight everyone wanted to see, but Tyson Fury gave a very poignant interview yesterday saying that he needed this fight, not for the money or anything like that, but because <laughs> he's got nothing else in his life, he's got no purpose, it's affecting his mental health. And he became he, he came out of the last fight about eight, nine months ago with Dillian, Dillian White, having beaten him quite comfortably. And he said, you know, what do I do now? And so he needed that fight. And then he was, Chisora was the most obvious candidate around. So they're fighting tonight at Tottenham Hotspur, full house. Very rare that we get an outdoor boxing match in, uh, in December. As Gareth A. Davis, our boxing expert, said this morning, he said that we're going to need to wrap up with a woolly hat and scarf on it tonight. <laughs> I can hardly keep up with things. I thought he was giving up. I thought he was going to Yeah, he stop. says that all the time. But he actually says he was genuine last time, but he said he realised he couldn't. Wasn't that far long ago that he was giving he's up? Just given, he's given up about ten times in his career, but, they, but well, boxers often do that. But this time he actually meant it, but he said the reason it looks hollow is because he's come back, but he realised he needs boxing. He's only 34. When you're doing that all your life, you come from 10 generations of traveller traveler history, 10, 10 generations of bare-knuckle fighting. It's a difficult thing to give up. Oh, I can't get over the fight doing it in the in the outside. It's going to be freezing. Yeah, I know, yeah. but they're going to, I think they're going to move around, though, Phil. They'll get Are they? Yeah, yeah, I think so. They're <laughs> heavyweights. They don't move around very fast. <laughs> I know, they don't. It's the fans I feel sorry for. Well, I'll sooner be the fans than in the ring. Coronation Street. Yes, apparently they've got a new set. I don't know if you're Corrie fans. I do love a little bit of 
double curry on a Friday night. But um, I'm not sure about this new set because for me, I like the old school feel. And I, went that's the old, the... I went to the original in 1991 at Granada. Oh, here we go, name days. dropping. And I look, no, I looked through the letterbox and it's just, it's just, a, it's just a fascia. <laughs> it's just a fascia, isn't it? Not like, not like Brookside, this, which was filmed on location. Is this a new, like, Real a new Rover's thing. Return? Yeah. It's, it's kind of, they've got a dessert shop, bakery, pound store, charity shop, takeaway and pawn breakers. So uh, I'm not sure. I think the charm is that it is old fashioned <laughs> and that's, you know, that makes me like happy. What happened, so, to, the what happened to the cabin? Well, yeah, it's going, I think. Is it? Oh, wow. really? Oh, wow. that, I mean, that, that's yeah. Yeah. got a petition right yeah. here, right now. Keep the gap in. I know. So, I mean, I don't know how many years Coronation Street has been running, but a long, long time. It's and... been going for 61 years. Oh, you're a Curry fan, Aiden. Really, Is that something 30, you're not telling us? It was 30 years when I went in 1991, so I've just done some basic arithmetic and worked out <laughs> 61. I mean, he's a mind of use. He's on top me. form today, I'm isn't he? I'm in the pub quiz team. <laughs> See, you thought he was out there, Mr. You know, nightclub, this, that, the other. Uh, no, no, he isn't. He's at home watching Corey. He loves that. Right. I'm all like Jack Duckworth these days. <laughs> 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 very much indeed fantastic for you to be with us yet again. Look, that's it from us today. We've had such a fun, fun show. Don't go anywhere, because next is Alistair Stewart and Friends. Morning, Alex Deegan here with your weekend weather forecast. Chilly one out there this weekend, thanks to easterly winds. Many of us will be dry, but there will be a few showers around, particularly in the east. It's high pressure dominating our weather. The centre of this high is a long way away, but low pressure down to the southwest. And between the two, they're generating these easterly winds, bringing the air in from the North Sea, which is never a warm direction. It's also in the east where we'll see most of the showers today, scattered across eastern parts of England and Scotland, maybe some more persistent drizzly rain over the highlands and the western isles. Elsewhere, many places dry, perhaps a bit brighter than yesterday. It's not as foggy as recent mornings, and we should see a bit more in the way of sunshine. A bit chilly in places, first thing by this afternoon. Temperatures only struggling up to 6, 7, maybe 8 Celsius, but add on that breeze, it will feel colder than that. And still a few showers around this evening, particularly over northern England, down into the Midlands, one or two across the southeast as well. We'll keep some outbreaks of rain going across the western Isles of Scotland.